Amy, I've been at this a long time. I've been a reporter in television news more than 30 years. I have never sat across <laughs> from a table from somebody who has a story like yours to tell. Oh, thank you. Brutally raped, left for dead. Why are you doing this interview? Well, that's a good question. I feel like there are so many women who don't have the courage or the voice or the support system to be heard. And they're, you know, there comes a time when you really have to stand up for yourself and um, maybe along the lines help other people, you know, with your story. The story is one where a judge said, I've never seen anything so brutal in my time on the bench. Correct. You were 25 years old. You went to give a coworker a ride home. What happened? Well, um, I was walked to my car by uh, the closing bartender um, and he was standing across the street and he knocked on my window and said that he had had too much to drink and if I could give him a ride home. So I sort of reluctantly decided that I would give him a ride home. Did you home. know him at all? He didn't speak English. He, he didn't speak English. Um, I did know him as an acquaintance. He, we had worked together for probably close to two years and so just so you knew through, him. Yeah, I knew friend. him working through the restaurant. You know, obviously we didn't have many conversations due, you know, due to the fact that he didn't speak English. But uh, I did know him. You know, we smiled at one another. He was friendly, as far as I knew, and um, so I thought that I could trust him, basically. So he gets in the car, and what happens? Um, he proceeds to kind of direct me. And you're uh, driving through New Haven. Yeah, he said that he lived in Fairhaven was what I understood so I sort of headed that way and um, he was sort of just kind of directing me and eventually we got lost I had no idea where I was um, I you know I live I don't live in New Haven and uh, I live about 30 minutes outside of New Haven so I'm not that familiar with the area um, it's kind of the type of thing where you just get on the highway and go home so you know we were in and out of all these streets taking left hand turns right hand turns and uh, before I knew it, I was lost. I had been driving for about 45 minutes. Was something in your mind telling you this isn't right? Eventually, you know, after about 25 minutes of him really kind of being strange, and, you know, I had chalked it up to him being inebriated, but I really think that he was nervous because he was looking for a spot to start the attack. So you're 25 years old. He's how old? Um, I believe at the time he was 27 doesn't speak English well. He was from Not Mexico. Well, correct. Um, what happens when you get to a place where the car stops? Well, it actually, we got to a point where I was so frustrated and that I started to get, I knew that there was something wrong. My body started to shake a little bit. I knew that there was something wrong that I pulled over. And I tried to tell him, I'm sorry, I'm just, I can't drive you anymore. You need to get out. And that's when the attack started. He actually um, grabbed the crotch of his jeans and asked me how much, indicating that he wanted to pay for sex. And uh, everything sort of went white from there. And, and what do you mean it went white? Um, well, you, you blanked I out. You I didn't realize blank, you were in no, trouble. No, I didn't blank out. I realized I was in trouble. My stomach dropped. I, you know just looked at what he was doing and I immediately snapped back and I started saying no and I started saying no louder and louder and repeating myself and I was pointing to the door telling him to get out of my car and not so nicely in those words but asking him to get out of the car and um, he started to lean forward close to me and I had my phone and I was I actually begun to get out of my car I was dialing 911 as I was doing so, and he had gotten out of the passenger drawer, ran around, and smashed the phone out of my hand, smashed it on the ground, and punched me in the face. So that was how the attack started. Were you unconscious, or you knew what was going on? I knew what was going on. I hit the ground, um, and I remember being by my back driver's side tire and on the ground and bleeding. I remember seeing the blood spraying on the pavement, and... Uh, he picked me up by my hair, opened the 
passenger back door behind the driver's side and threw me in the car. And he was swearing at me, telling me, you know, to shut up in so many words. And um, at that point, I was just trying to calm him down because I really wanted, you know, to take control of the situation. You were, you were in a survival mode? Absolutely. Yeah, you, I, once, once I got hit, you know, a couple times, I, I immediately said, okay, Amy, this is real, this is happening, now we need to get you, keep you safe and get you out of the situation somehow and get help. What happens next? Um, I, we sort of went back and forth. I was trying to plead with him. I was saying no and please, and um, he was just swearing at me, telling me to shut up. And um, at that point, he uh, pulled his pants down and forced me to give him oral sex. And um, I was raped in the back of that car for about a half an hour um, in different positions and where does your head go when this is happening? How do you, how do you make it through something like this? Um, at that point... Do you go numb? Not at that point. I hadn't. Um, I did throughout the night, um, later on in the evening. But at that point, I was still thinking, how can I get out of this? How can I get help? You know, my cell phone is gone. I don't know where I am. There was a house across the street with their lights out where we were parked. So I was thinking, I gotta get to that house. I gotta get to that house. Um, all the while, I was being raped at the same time. So. You get out of the car. I didn't get out of the car at that point. I, um, he had switched positions and I was face down in the car. And I realized that I had an old cell phone that, you know, when you upgrade your new phone, you know, it was just thrown in between the console. And I remembered that you can call 911 on those phones. So I snuck the phone and I hid it underneath um, a coat in the back seat of my car and I dialed 911 without him knowing. What is he raped. doing while you managed to he was, get a phone? He was still standing. He was standing outside the car behind me. Um, I think he was nervous. He was sort of looking to his left and to his right to make sure no cars were coming. I mean, we were right on the street at this point in a residential area. Um, there was no, uh, I don't think that there was any street lights. It was pretty dark, um, but we were literally probably 50 feet away from somebody's front door. At the time, this was probably about two in the morning at this point, 2.15. So I think that he was nervous. He knew he wasn't in the right spot, you know, and, and he, you know. So you dialed 911. I dialed 911, but I couldn't say anything. I could vaguely, vaguely hear people from, you know, my phone saying, hello, is anybody there? And I was trying to make noise. I was sort of... Because you were so close to a house. Exactly. I was sort of, um, I was bleeding heavily, so I was kind of like moaning. I just said, you know, I tried to say, Angel, I'm bleeding, you know, just, just to see hope that uh, the people on the other end of the line could hear that there was somebody there and it wasn't just you know an accidental dial I was just hoping that they could hear that somebody was in trouble and that possibly they could figure out where the phone was and figure out my location what happens next he stepped away from the car and I slammed the door shut and I locked the door I jumped into the driver's side and uh, I looked for the keys and I realized that he had taken the keys so the same time I had locked the door he was trying to unlock the door so we sort of did a cat and mouse thing where he would unlock it and I would you know slam the lock shut and I have the phone in my hand and I'm trying to dial 911 and he gets the door open and what I did was I slammed the driver's door into his body so I could run past him and I got about halfway to the front door of the house, and he punched me in the back. Are you able to scream? I screamed like the Dickens. And I nobody screamed, comes. Yeah, I screamed louder. The scream still haunts me. <laughs> I, um, it's something that I hear in my head still to this day. So you're in a residential area. N now he takes you somewhere else. Yeah. He got me. He beat me on this person's front lawn to the point of unconsciousness. And he dragged me back into the car and pushed me into the passenger seat. 
and proceeds to take off and drive somewhere else. Where do you end up? We ended up um, in East Rock Park, which I didn't know was East Rock Park, but that's I didn't know at the time where we were. At the time, I thought it was a cemetery because it was so dark and there was a field. I thought, oh, God, he's taking me to a cemetery and he's going to kill me. Um, we turned onto a road, and there was a car waiting to turn left at a stop sign. And I literally threw myself out of the car trying to get help, trying to get this person. And attention. this person doesn't see you either. They, I don't know how they didn't see me, but they didn't stop. They just kept going. My legs were kicking outside the car. I had slid, and he had me by my hair. And I was, he sort of crashed into the side of East Rock. And he got out of the car and punched me and beat me until I got back in the car. You were raped again? Yes. On the way to East Rock Park. You get to the park. When is it clear to you that you're worried you're not going to live through this? As soon as we got to the park, and uh, he just was getting angrier, more angry as time went on. And the more I fought and tried to get away, the angrier he got. He pulled me through a field, and I was asking him, are you going to kill me? And he just kept You're talking. actually saying these words, are you going to kill me? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he said? Uh, shut the F up, uh, calling me every name in the books. Did you, know? you hear the Spanish word for murder? Did you, did you hear no. this? No, he wasn't telling me at that point uh, that he was going to kill me. He was just telling me to shut up. He just wanted to get me into the woods, into a, a place that it was so secluded that I, he knew I wouldn't try to get help at that point, or I wouldn't be able to, at least. So at some point he becomes enraged? Yes and tries to kill you. Yeah. After uh, he raped me in the woods, probably for another hour, hour and a half of rape in the woods, and um, he took me down a trail. It was probably about five to ten a minute walk in the dark. I was barefoot at this point. I had my glasses had been knocked off my face. Um, it was pitch black, and he just kind of dragged me through the woods, and then there was sort of a, an embankment clearing in the middle of this path and that's where it happened for about two hours somewhere he tells you he was sorry you write in your victim's impact statement correct he says he's sorry moments before he attempted to kill you yeah um when he decided that he was done raping me he uh proceeded to get his clothes on and I reached for my clothes, but he told me no. So I was sitting there crouched, and I was naked in the woods uh, with my knees up to my chest. And he sort of bent down in front of me, and he said some words in Spanish that I didn't understand. But he was saying muerte, and he kept going like this with his finger across his throat. Could you see this in the dark? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, it was moonlight, you know, mm -hmm. and your eyes eventually adjust. So I could see him. and. Um, so it registered to me what he was telling me because he kept doing this and pointing up and he kept saying morte over and over again. So I started to cry. I started to beg him. I said anything. I said, do you want money? You know, I tried anything. I said, I wouldn't tell anybody. Please just let me live, you know. And uh, he said, oh, money. And he put his hand out like I had money there sitting naked in the woods. And he laughed at me. And he told me to shut up. And what happens? He made, he made me accept the fact that he was going to kill me. He made me, he didn't start actually trying to kill me until I said yes. Until I shook my head yes. And um, at this point, did you think, I'm going to die here? Yeah. And nobody's going to know? Absolutely. And had you succumbed to that? Um, was there any fight left at all? No, not really. I didn't. I just was at a loss at that point. I didn't know what to do. Um, he, so he hits you. Yeah. He starts. I was berated with punches. I was on the ground. He was kicking me. He had boots on. I was being stomped on. He tried to break my neck. He tried to snap my neck from behind. Um, I was beaten with a large branch. Um, he tried to poke my eyes out with the branch. He was basically. Um, 
pounding on my face, you know, standing over me. Um, me and time, I was just kind of rolling with whatever impact I was receiving. Uh, and at some point, I just told myself, let go, let go, let go. I just didn't want to feel it anymore. And that's when I just stopped responding. I stopped, my body stopped responding to whatever it was he was doing to me. I, I was being hit in the head with a huge branch. And, um, you played dead. I played dead. I wasn't, I wasn't thinking so literally at the time, but that's what happened. My body knew to play dead. And, um, had he thought that he had killed you? Yes. And he walked away? Yeah. He gave me sort of one last kick to make sure I was dead. And I was laying there, and I heard leaves crunching, and I heard him buckle his belt on his jeans, and I heard him walking out of the woods. And I just laid there, and I didn't move. And I tried to wait until I couldn't hear anything. And I probably laid there for about 15 minutes not moving, thinking so scared that he was going to come back. How did you have the courage and the strength to get up and go to that house and ring the doorbell well, to get help? After laying there for about 15 minutes, I said, well, I'm not dead, Amy. You have to do something. You have to get up and you have to try and get help. Otherwise, you are, you're going to bleed to death out here. You're going to die and somebody's going to come across your body laying in the woods like this and you can't let that happen. So you ring a doorbell. You, you actually walk, bleeding, no clothes on. Mm -hmm. You ring a doorbell. Yeah. Then what happens? Um, eventually, a man came to the door, and um, I was such a mess. My eyes were swollen shut. Uh, I had longer hair at the time. My hair was, you know, completely covered and matted with blood and leaves and dirt. Um, all I could say was help. My lungs were filled with blood. I had been blood was coming out of my mouth um, and I think I scared the dickens out of him <laughs> and um, his wife came to the door and they shut the lights off and locked the door and they sort of just called 911 but left me outside and um, at that point I said oh geez I just sat down I couldn't I didn't have feeling in my legs anymore I just sat down I kind of paced around for a second but I did know that they were on the phone with 911 and they came to the door. 911 dispatcher was asking them questions about what kind of car I had, um, if I knew my license plate number, things like that. You wind up in the hospital at some point. Yes. What starts to happen as a rape victim? Mm -hmm. You've said to me that so many women do not come forward because you get into the system now and you become victimized or can become victimized again, which is. One reason you're here right. doing this interview to be a victim's advocate to say you can get help. Very much, yeah. You're in the hospital for how long? Now, you needed surgery because your eye was badly damaged. Yeah, um, both my cheekbones were shattered, my nose was broken, um, my right eye orbit was completely shattered, um, multiple ribs were broken, I, had, uh, I was covered from head to toe in bruises and scrapes. Um, I had surgery. I had about 100, over 100 stitches in my face alone um, that I went, you know, right away. And then two weeks after I was released from the hospital, I had to go back to receive plates in my face because the bones weren't healing. They were shattered to the point where they were like an eggshell. So I have a plate in my cheek and I have a plate underneath my eye here to support the eye orbit. Do you have any vision problems? Um, some. I've gone up in glasses. Um. Moreno Hernandez Jose Angel was sentenced to 80 years. Yes. What was the criminal justice system like that you went through? It was a total roller coaster. Um, the process itself took three years, I mean, and uh, that I think is ridiculous, to be honest. Um, it's understandable considering the overload that, you know, the courthouse has, you know, these, they're limited in attorneys, they're limited, there's just so many cases that things, everything, there's always factors that prolong the case, you know, things get delayed. Um, 
What is it like to sit there and to relive this over and over again in, in the courtroom? Did you have to look? Yeah. At I had to point them out. Um, my testimony took about two and a half hours. And uh, there was actually, once I sat down and started telling the story and I had the courage to, to look him in the eye, to actually do it, I felt more powerful and I wasn't afraid anymore. It, up to that point, I was extremely nervous about it. I was really scared to just be in the same room with him and he was staring at me. Um, but by sort of taking that back and I thought of it as exposing him for what he was and to not feel so exposed anymore. This was about pointing him out for the monster that he is, not about me being a victim anymore. You were three years out mm -hmm. or so mm -hmm. from Just the about, attack. Yeah. You are healing every day. Every day. Give me an idea of the regimen, and and there are bottles in front of us. Like yeah, that's just a, an idea of what you know somebody goes through after it is a roller coaster of therapy and medication, and that's what you have to do. That's why I'm here today. Um, but we, I think, we just don't think about that. What people go through on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, there's post-traumatic stress, there's depression, there's anxiety, there's panic attacks, there's um, withdraw, there's anger, there's just so many emotions that you go through just trying to work out what's actually happened to you that you really need the help to get through it and medication can be one of them. What kinds Psychotherapy. of psychotherapy? You're taking antidepressants? You're t taking, taking antidepressants, anti-anxieties. Um, I have migraines because of the trauma, you know. Um, just on a need basis, you know, the, the antidepressants are every day because I do still suffer from the post-traumatic stress sy symptoms and, you know, I can't force myself to heal any faster than my body is allowing. So I just accept that. And Do you have any normal days? Um, Are they becoming more plentiful at all? Absolutely. Yeah, I can smile at things now. I can be present. I uh, enjoy life and actually to an extent I appreciate things more than I did prior to the attack because I know how precious it is and there are days but it's always there. I don't think it'll ever really leave me. It just becomes easier to deal with. You brought a knife with you. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Well, where, uh, where is that knife at home? It's under my pillow. Uh, shortly after the attack, when I was living at my mother's house, um, embarrassing. I was a little embarrassed by it, but she discovered that I had a hammer. I had snuck a hammer underneath my pillow because I was so frightened. I thought any night he would come back. Even though he was in jail, it's still the, the fear that he was going to come back and finish the job, that he, I was going to wake up and he would be standing over me and I would be dead. So I had to protect myself. I was hyper aware. You know, I would stay up till four o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, and to this day, I still, I still have those nights where I can't go to sleep and I, you know, I check my windows, check my locks once, twice. Do you have flashbacks as often I've, as you used to? Not as often as I used to. Do you see his face? No, not, not anymore. But probably for the first year and a half after the attack, I felt very haunted by him. You said to me, that rape is not about sex, it's about control. I, I don't believe rape is about sex itself. I think it's more about violence and control. I think that that is what the criminal is looking for, the rapist. How do you want to go forward with your life and help others? You know, I just, I feel that by telling my story and showing people, you know, what the justice process is like, that if I could help one person maybe come forward and, you know, break the silence as far as this, you do not have to be ashamed that it's not your fault. You know, there's so much guilt Why does society do that? I don't know. And do you feel that they do, that they, they, they somehow say, well, you must have been in the wrong place at the wrong time yeah. or, or you were too suggestive or... Absolutely, absolutely. There's, for some reason, I believe society our culture is to victim blame 
And I don't know if that's to sort of separate ourselves from the victim, to, you know, to make ourselves more comfortable, to say, well, this can't happen to me because I don't do the things that this, this person does. I don't, you know, I'm, prepare, I, I'm careful, I prepare myself, you know. This, it's a way of separating themselves, so it's not so scary. But we do need to realize that these are our neighbors, these are our daughters. Can be sister. anybody. It's anybody. And I think society really realized that with my case because I'm kind of the poster child for what you should do when somebody is hurt and everybody came forward and rallied and there was fundraisers and I was, you know, finding the right therapy was amazing for me and uh, I want to give back somehow because I feel like for some reason you're writing about your story I started writing as soon as I got back from the hospital I just, it was a way of getting everything out for me I, um, it was flashbacks it was what I was going through it was, I used it as a diary and there was some poetry you know, anything that I had inside me that felt like I had to get out just went right onto paper do you hope that it becomes a book? I would like, I would like to. I really would. Um, I, I read a lot of books in my healing, and I found that to be profi profoundly important to my process, is to know that you're not alone and that it happens to other women. And you can, can sort of get through to the other side. You know, there, there is hope and, you know, becoming, you know, not just a victim but a survivor. And you can thrive after this. It's not... It's not the end. Which is huge for somebody of such a young age to say. You were Thank 25 you. years old. Yeah. Just working hard, 60 hours a week, working at a restaurant. Two jobs, yeah. Two jobs. <laughs> and this happens, and, it's, and it stops your life. In many ways, is intimacy in other relationships profoundly difficult after something like this happens? Oh, absolutely. Um, I am with the same person that I was at the time of the attack, so we've been through it together, um, and we've sort of faced those challenges along the way. You know, we've done therapy together, and it's, you know, once in a while it's still hard to this day, but it's something that you really, you can't just give up on. You can't give up on yourself. You just have to work through it. You have to get out the door and get to the therapy that you need and do the work. It's, it's, it's work. That's exactly what it is. And sometimes when you're in that space, that's the last thing you want to do. You just want to stay in bed with the covers pulled over your head. But it, that's part of my goal is to let people know that if you do the work, you will find yourself on the other side of an attack like this or a rape, you know. You said to me that many women who go through a sexual assault do not come forward. Yeah, um, I believe it's something like 74% of women don't come forward. Uh, because they're scared, they're frightened, that person is still out there, it's somebody that they know or that they're close to. And um, I think that's really sad. It makes me really sad that we are so scared, you know, as women and the way that society is, that we find that we can't even come forward when something like this happens. Plans for the future, Amy? Well, um, I'm going to get married <laughs> eventually. Uh, I'm engaged and I hope to write a book. Um, I just, you know, I'm in an advocacy group now, you know, maybe do talks, just get myself out there, meet other victims and um, try to make something happen, you know, victims, rights in general, legislation, just as much as I can do to advocate for this, you know, sexual violence in general. I'm, it's part of me, it's embedded in my soul, and I am on a mission to help. <laughs> well, you're a great advocate to do that. Thank and you so much. I thank you for telling a very brave story. Thank you. And hoping that it helps somebody else out there. But the message is it can be, it can happen to your wife. Absolutely. Your daughter, your cousin, yeah. your grandmother. It can happen. Can so thank you for telling your story. Thank you for having me.